again. Simon Webb here. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but a very interesting paper has just been published in the journal Nature called Papers and Patents are Becoming Less Disruptive Over Time. <laughs> the idea is that since the 1950s, uh, papers and patents have gone from being radical, doing dramatic things, dramatic changes, really rocking the boat, to just sort of very, very minor changes, but that don't, that don't really rock the boat or change anything. I, I must say, I found this rather ironic. <coughs> Rather ironic that it would be in nature of all journals if you consider that nature has just put in a policy saying that if you submit research that doesn't fit with their ideological agenda and questions their dogmas on certain politically correct issues that we won't mention, then they will simply reject the research out of hand. It strikes me as quite obvious uh, what has happened. People are less free. Academics are less free, that academia has been taken over by people that don't agree with the fundamental idea that you should pursue the truth, and so therefore um, academic research has become less radical and less disruptive. Uh, if actually the, the, the degree to which the disruptive has declined um, it flattened out by the 2000s, and that of course was because of the rise probably of the internet and access to information, which has allowed people like me, who, and, and let's face it, we don't really know much about me, but I'm probably some sort of autodictat, to have access to a a great deal of information and thus become a successful historian. So I thought today I would <coughs> um, I would look at why it is then that disruptiveness in academia has decreased since the 1950s. Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic. Now I'd like to do a quick video today on this very interesting new paper, Papers and Patents Have Declined in Their Level of Disruptiveness um, Since the 1950s, as published in the journal Nature. But before we do that, a quick word from our sponsor. Well, first, a word from our sponsor. Now, we are all truth seekers here at the Jolly Heretic Public House, but here's the problem, chaps. We can only get to the truth if we have multiple perspectives, if we have multiple interpretations, if we have access to the other side, if we have access to all viewpoints. Only then can we really understand what's going on in the world, and we are increasingly finding that we cannot do that. Information is blocked, websites are blocked, alternative perspectives are blocked, and so the only way around this, realistically, is some form of VPN. And as far as I can see, Atlas VPN gives you everything you can possibly need. There is currently a steel Black Friday deal going on in which you can get Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.70 per month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This is the best VPN offer Atlas have ever done and it's a time-limited offer so it's it's time to get on with it, chaps. Uh, there are all kinds of benefits to Atlas VPN. It's uh, you, As I say, there's this offer, of just uh, this, this, this brilliant offer. Uh, you can unlock your favourite content from all over over the world. If you can't access your favourite program or whatever, your Atlas VPN has got you covered. You can keep your Google searches secret and private using Atlas VPN. You can stop ads and malware. You can save money online. It will give you the get you, get you the best deals while shopping online and it will, it will all that kind of stuff. And you can protect unlimited devices using Atlas VPN. As I say, uh, there is a fantastic offer on at the moment uh, in which it's just uh, it's uh, $1.70 a, a month plus six months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Guarantee. So this really is the, the cheapest and best way to get a VPN. We increasingly need VPNs. We are, we, we are, we are, the truth is blocked. The truth is covered up. We can't get access to information. And in a, in a, in a society that's doing this to us, uh, we need a VPN. And as far as I can see, Atlas VPN is, is where it's at, chaps. OK, we're back in the room. So what's going on? Uh, new paper come out in uh, Nature, getting a lot of discussion. Papers and patents are becoming less disruptive over time by Mark Park, Erin Leahy and Russell J. Fink. And b based on various measures, they demonstrate that uh, so the papers that are published are becoming more incrementalist over time uh, and much less radical. They're much less likely to push the discipline in a new and radical direction uh, and, and come up with something highly original, which questions everything and which, uh, you know, comes up with something brilliant, basically. And this is completely consistent, of course, with evidence that I've looked at in my book with Michael Woodley of Benny at our wits end, why we're becoming less intelligent and what it means for the future that levels of genius um, are going down over time, levels of per capita major innovation are going down um, over time, 
this is all this this all completely fits in. And as I was having Simon say there, it's rather ironic that this should be published in the journal Nature when it's the journal Nature that is specifically standing in the way of radical uh, new research that shakes things up. It's the journal Nature that has rules now that say that if you submit something and it, it doesn't fit with certain woke dogmas, then it is to be rejected out of hand, and that is that. So they are an example of the problem. Now, there's a lot of people sort of wringing their hands and trying to work out why it is that this has happened. I mean, the essence of it is, since about 1950, there has been a dramatic decline um, in disruptive research, in research which, which really shakes things up, shakes the field up and brings it in new and radical directions. This goes down and down and down, but any explanation also has to explain why it is that the extent to which it declines lessens from about 1995, the year 2000 onwards. It's still declining, but it's declining to a much lesser extent. So that's the essence of the figures. So what is the explanation? Well, it strikes me there are three key issues behind doing brilliant research, which really shakes things up and innovates and whatever. One is simply intelligence. Uh, if you are intelligent, then you notice the relationships between different things and you're able to come up with a salute with a with, with a with a with a new idea. And this means that you, you know, you'll you, you come up with a radical idea. The second is simply genius and the nurturing of genius. <clears throat> what is genius? Genius is outlier high intelligence combined with basically moderately psychopathic traits and autistic traits. This means that you are obsessed with the truth and obsessed with systematizing, that you um, are relatively low in conscientiousness, i.e. impulse control and rule following, and this allows you to think outside the box and come up with radical ideas and make radical connections which other people would, would, just, would just find unthinkable. Uh, and you are, because you are high in autism perhaps, relatively low in agreeableness. You either don't understand that your ideas are going to offend people or you simply don't care. Uh, and therefore you don't care about rocking the boat and you present your ideas. Now what we've had previously was a university system which encouraged genius, which basically made people could just go away and do whatever they wanted, um, and the, the genius had a kind of safe space. So that's the next thing. Um, the third thing is simply uh, freedom. If you have the freedom to question things and there are no consequences, then you're, you're better able to do so. And the fourth issue is just uh, access to information and scholarly networks. I mean, we, were may, we may have been absolutely brilliantly intelligent in about 1800, but the degree to which we could access information and new ideas are about <clears throat> demonstrating the relationship between A and B, about seeing the bigger picture, about consilience, about showing um, the relationship between two different um, ideas and so forth. Uh, and so the ability to see those, those uh, relationships is weakened uh, if you can't access information. Now, what has happened since 1950? Well, uh, basically, we, we have to have an optimum relationship between these different traits. Uh, and that optimum relationship... <laughs> Um, that optimum relationship um, uh, has been disrupted. So first of all, we know that since 1950, IQ has gone down. We are losing something like 1.2 IQ points per decade, something like that. So we have simply become less intelligent. That's the first reason why it would decline. Secondly, the nature of the university has changed. The university has changed from being an elite institution to which only extremely intelligent people went and Probably the 1950s is reflecting the fact that you had a system of grammar schools that were brought in for working class intelligent kids uh, a couple of generations earlier. And so those people are by then academics. And so, yes, Oxford and Cambridge and such like places are highly nepotistic and let in posh people because they've been to the right school. But increasingly, you've got people going there because they're just good. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and, and so you've got more and more people like that. Those people are being brought to their phenotypic maximum intelligence. Uh, those people are being um, a, a, are able to, uh, pres uh, to, to contribute uh, what they can contribute, and, and, and they're not under-promoted anymore. So you've got more and more people like that. So, you, but, so that's the nature of the university. The university does brilliant things. The university becomes highly prestigious. And, of course, the result of that is that the university increasingly attracts what we call the midwit, i.e. people that are attracted to prestige, Machiavellians, narcissists, but that aren't particularly intelligent uh, and that put power uh, being admired before the truth. And those people gradually, of course, take over the university um, and then sort of the, the university ceases to be a safe space 
for the genius. And so the genius is basically sort of removed from the university and no longer has access to the facilities which he needs in order to do particularly brilliant research as the university becomes uh, taken over by these midwits. And then obviously it, it gets worse that the university expands and therefore uh, more and more people go to university. It brings in lower and lower IQ people. This changes the culture of the university, which becomes uh, less and less about the autistic pursuit of truth and more and more about just, um, you know, a, 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 it based around you know the, what I lower IQ people come up with, which is fallacious arguments, illogical arguments, attraction to dogma. Uh, people with mid with who have high intelligence within the normal range tend to. Um, be highly conformist. They tend to take that which they tend to notice that which is uh, uh, which is the dominant world view, persuade themselves, convince themselves of its veracity, and then signal their adherence to it, leading to a kind of runaway system where where whatever the dominant world view is, is 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 pushed to become more and more extreme. And so then that kind of takes over the university, and gradually the universities just become factories for the current ideology, and they're complete. And people that are high in intelligence, which tends to very very high intelligence, tends to call it autism, uh, find this anathema, and they're basically pushed out of the universities so that's the they can't cope with it not who you're going to who you're going to employ of course the the genius who the potential genius who is a bit of a weirdo and offends everybody um or, or the sort of relatively high iq midwit uh who who uh, conforms and who who who's who socially skilled so of course it's the, the midwittery of the university is the second uh, the second issue that's changed which then suppresses genius uh, and 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 uh, puts above uh, the, the autistic pursuit of truth, um, things like uh, not offending people, uh, <laughs> truly a bit of a cold, um, not offending people, uh, everyone getting along, um, and, and whatever the dominant set of values are, in this case, individualism. That's the second thing. Um, the third thing, then, of course, is that the, the genius is then removed from the university. Um, the fourth thing is simply freedom. Now, we can argue that what you had in the 1950s was something of an optimum. You've got to remember that there was a period, certainly up until 1870, and where the university was formally a factory of the regime's ideology, and that ideology was a group-oriented ideology, and that was the group-oriented ideology of Christianity. It, to go to be a, an Oxford, Cambridge or Durham, you had to be a confessing Anglican. To be an academic there, you had to be, uh, for any period of time, you had to be ordained. Um, so you had, and so therefore, you, and, the, and then you, the whole university wasn't about the pursuit of truth. The university was a factory for the dogmas of the society, which was the, a group-oriented understanding of Christianity, which basically upheld nationalism or English nationalism or something like that as the will of God. That's what it was. Now, this has now been replaced uh, as we flipped over in the 1960s. You know, about 20% of people become individualist and then you notice that's the up and coming thing and so intelligent people start to sort of migrate over to that you get a tipping point effect and and, and then you get runaway individualism so we now have a new ideology which is not promoting obedience to authority uh, the, the group oriented values of obedience to authority uh, and uh, um, uh, group orientation and sanctity but is promoting the individually oriented values of equality and harm avoidance and sanctifying those as a kind of new religion and that has now taken over the universities and in order to become a member of a good university you know you have to show that you you believe in equality and you have to show that you've acted to help equality and whatever it's basically a test of faith it's 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 it's, it's the in the same way that to be uh, in, at oxford before 1870 you had to say, I am a confessing member of the Church of England. I believe in these dogmas. Now you have to say, I'm a confessing member of the multi of the wokeness, woke cult. I believe in these dogmas. So there was a period of optimum freedom where Christianity, basically, and its influence had substantially declined. But the new replacement religion of wokeness hadn't risen up yet. And I would suggest that that may have been sometime around sort of 1950, remembering that 1960s was the tipping point where we start really the, the, the revolution um, into, into, into wokeness and individualism. Um, and uh, finally, the other thing that you need to have, uh, this is just access. Access to scholarly networks, access to information, uh, you know, and, and if you have the more information you have access to, the more you're able to come up with solutions and come up with radical new ideas. So what do we have? Well, we can. it's quite obvious what's happened. As I say, IQ has gone down, therefore level of disruptiveness goes down. Midwittery has gone up. 
uh, taken control of the universities, uh, stopped people from being able to have original ideas, stopped people from daring to question certain dogmas, created a, 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 a general system where you have to conform, um, and therefore uh, disruptive research goes down because you have you can't do it or you'll get sacked, basically. Um, geniuses are therefore basically pushed out of the universities. It's the geniuses who, who come up with the original stuff. They now don't got to have a safe space to do it in, so therefore they don't come up with their original ideas. So therefore, again, disruptiveness goes down. Um, the general freedom, uh, the academic freedom has also gone down. Um, but the one thing that has happened, and I think this explains why there's a levelling off effect of the decline in the early 2000s, is that about that time, access to information goes up with the rise of the internet. And it goes up to such an enormous extent that you're able to get the sort of Simon Webb types, the independent scholars and whatever that you couldn't previously possibly have got because you need to have access to a university library. And so that sort of, um, that lessens the impact of whatever else is going on and it slows down the collapse of highly original ideas. But eventually, but it's, but the, but it's not enough to completely counter it because the disruptiveness is still in decline. Um, but it's it's uh, it, it's enough to slightly slow it down. And what you would expect, perhaps at the current rate of things, is eventually even that counter effect is overwhelmed by the destruction of the universities as you get 50% of people going there. And so they're basically just places for average people and their whole culture changes to cater to that. Um, uh, and the increasing grasp of, of the new ideology of political political correctness. Now, some people say, oh, well, there's other reasons that they showed in the paper that it's not to do with the low hanging fruit argument. That's not consistent with the data, this idea that oh, we, we've got all of the major stuff. And, and also that's not how new ideas work. New ideas are that you see you see the relationship between variables. So there's no such thing as the low hanging fruit argument. Um, so I think that that is how it works. So um, that's why uh, there's less disruption, chaps. Hello, hello, hello! The Jolly Heretic is an online public house which meets on Mondays and Thursdays at 7pm UK time, 2pm New York, in which we discuss the kind of based, fearless science which is increasingly expunged from our woke, joke universities. If you would like to help the Jolly Heretic public house, and there are many ways you can do so, please, please, please become one of my patrons on Subscribestar. Also, if you want to, you can donate to the channel uh, using Odyssey and Entropy, and you can also purchase Jolly Heretic merchandise, such as uh, shirts and mugs. All of the links are in the description. Again, I'd be most violently grateful if you could assist the Jolly Heretic Public House and I will see you all soon and goodbye!